Good morning, church. Let's all rise for our first song. You can be seated. Today we will be continuing the sermon series, developing our spiritual life, and today we're going to talk about uh, meditating and memorizing God's words. Uh, Psalms chapter 145 and verse number 3 says, Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another, and they will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell me of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. And so there's, God has done an amazing work um, in the world, in this church, in your life, and in my life, and he wants, there's still more that he wants to do. And his word contains so many truths, and we need to, to meditate upon that. We need to memorize that. We need to fill our lives with that. And that's what this, word, this song talks about, thy word.
Good morning, everyone. That was a perfect song for this morning's communion. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purchased, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Mystery kind of falls into last week's sermon, the discussions that, we prob- that you probably had in your small groups. Mystery, as Paul has it here, is not the same word with which we're familiar with. When I think of mystery, I think of somebody like Agatha Christie, the great bamboozler of all time. I speak as one of those who have been bamboozled. I have never yet been able to penetrate the whodunits. I think of myself as being of average intelligence. So it's frustrating to read these mysteries and not be able to figure them out before the detective announces the solution. How do these mystery writers do that? Dorothy Sayers, another great mystery writer, explains it this way. If a thing could only be done one way, and if only one person could have done it that way, then you've got your suspect, your criminal, the person who has, who is responsible, if you will, motive or no motive. There's the how, the when, the where, the why, and the who. And when you've got the how, you've got the who. Communion reveals to us the mystery of God's purpose, the how. The how is Christ, the mystery of the ages. Mystery in the biblical use of the word means something which was hidden but is to be revealed at the proper time. Christ is the great mystery of God. From the beginning, it was God's intention that Christ should come. Throughout the Old Testament, we've seen scripture attesting to that. First, through prophecies. One thinks of Job crying out, I know that my Redeemer lives. And then, in more explicit terms, God makes it clear that the Messiah is to come. And then at the right time, Jesus arrived. The mystery was, as far as God was willing, revealed to us. We understand now that God, what God was driving at. He spent 2,000 or more years drilling it into one group just what kind of God he is so that we could know him when he came. The great point of that coming was the crucifixion. God's purpose in this visit was to provide a way back to him. And that way is through Jesus. We know how much he suffered on the cross. We know he did so willingly. And we know he did it for us. But there's more. The mystery is not yet fully revealed. Nor will it be until he accomplishes his ultimate purpose. To bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In communion, we proclaim not only the mystery revealed is coming to the cross, but also the mystery to be revealed is coming again. We do not yet know all of that information, We do not yet have all of that information, but we do know the how, 
the where, the why, and more specifically, the who. So let's take some time, think about the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and the promise that God made to us to send him back for us. Precious Father, we thank you for this time that we can <clears throat> remember the sacrifice of your Son, the promises you made to us, and all the pain and suffering that he went through. We thank you for this, we thank you for our salvation, and we thank you for all the love, mercy, and grace that you show us. In your Son's precious name we pray. Amen. Father and Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that we come around your table this morning. Remember the body and blood that you shed for us. And pray uh, as we go through the rest of this week that we live life that's pleasing to you. Thank you. In your name, pray. Amen.
Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Welcome. Beautiful day outside <coughs> and inside. Um, if you would like to stick around after services this morning, um, Amanda Rood is being baptized, so if you want to hang out for that. So. <coughs> so on to the other lesser import important messages. Still important, so don't 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 lose me here. Um, the fundraiser, and I got made fun of yesterday about what STPRC stands for, but it's the fundraiser for that. Um, the bottles are back there. We have one more week <coughs> left, so if you'd like to partic participate in that, grab a bottle and bring it back by next Sunday. Youth group is meeting this Friday. If you need transportation, um, let David or Leah know. We're <coughs> starting a mentor program here. Um, if you have any interest at all, even to find out more information, check with Leah, Leah or David, and they'll give you the information you need. And if you'd like to be a part of that, they can help you out with that as well. The youth are having a campfire Friday the 28th at the Frasers. We have a business meeting after church today, yay. Small groups are underway. Um, if you haven't joined, you're missing out. The, there's the four of them there, and the one that meets at Justin's house, led by Bill, are having a fun day today. I think they're playing kickball. So, if there's any Spartans on that team, you can crush them today. <laughs> They're not worth much. <laughs> Vacation Bible School is happening the 24th through the 26th. If you'd be a, like to be a part of that, save the date. Next weekend, next Saturday, <clears throat> we're having uh, the service project. If you would like more information, if you have something you'd like to donate or help, um, see Justine and she'll point you in the right direction there. Kids group meets Thursdays, mom's group, um, 9.30 here at the building, okay? 9.30 at the building. If you have, would like more information on different events, check the newsletter and the bulletin. Family of the week this week is Angel Bard and her kids. Keep them in your prayers. And if you have a young person between the ages of two and five, you'd like to go to Kids Church, Justine and Noelle will take them now. Thank you. Good morning, church. Today we're going to continue the study on um, developing our spiritual lives. And the, the subject for today is um, very applicable, I think, to a lot of things that we go through on a daily basis. So as we continue through this, we're going to be looking at meditating and memorizing God's word. And when we mention God's word, we're talking about the Bible there. Before we really get into what those words mean, meditate, and memorize, uh, I want to turn first to um, Joshua chapter 1. So if you look in Joshua chapter 1, um, it, it really frames a transition in the life of the people of Israel. So let's start right in the, the beginning of Joshua chapter 1. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Mo Moses' aid. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river of the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. 
As I was with, with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their answers, ancestors to give them. In that scripture right there, there's a lot of encouraging phrases that, you, that are still used today in our lives. And then verse 7 says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So in this scripture, there's, there's a lot of promises given to, to Joshua. And in those promises, it's connected to some very important phrases here. So I underlined it there that we need to keep, he needed to keep the book of the law always on his lips and meditate on it day and night so that he would be careful to obey those things taught to him. Now, in our lives, this idea of memory comes up a lot. Memory nowadays is talking a lot about computer devices, your phone, oh, my phone has a lot of memory, or my phone has no memory, or um, you can talk about computers and different electronic devices that way. But today we're going to be talking about our memory. We're going to be talking about um, memory, and then the other part is meditate. Now, I'm not terribly familiar with what it means to meditate on something, so before we go too far, I wanted to define what meditate means. Um, to meditate on something, that means that you have to think deeply or focus one's mind for a period of time, typically in quiet or silence. So meditate, when we're meditating on something, we're thinking deeply or focusing, typically in a quiet way for a period of time. That could be 10 seconds, it could be 10 hours. It, it, it really, there's really no definition for how long you have to meditate. In your life, I want you to think about when you've meditated on something. I also want you to think about when you've forgotten something. Who here has forgotten something important in their lives? Most of us, regardless of our cognitive abilities, have forgotten something here or there. Um, I know some very intelligent people who have got, forgotten some very big details. I know some people that have memory issues, so there's some more serious issues that people have with memory, sometimes associated with different diseases, sometimes associated with, um, with older age. And we're gonna, I'm going to share with you guys some different thoughts on memory, and then we're going to look into what the Bible says about memorizing and meditating on different things. One time, like for example, I, I've forgotten many things in my life. Um, thankfully, I haven't forgotten any important anniversaries or anything yet, thankfully. Um, but when Dinah and I moved back to the area a few years ago, um, we were, you know, getting mixed into different things, getting reintroduced to different, um, you know, getting acclimated to the area. Um, I decided to j join a gym for, uh, uh, to work out a little bit when we moved back. And this person in our gym class looked really familiar. And I'm like, I'm going to go introduce myself. I I've got to know this person from somewhere. And so I'm like, hi, I'm Caleb. Nice to meet you. Like, hi, I'm so-and-so. I was at your wedding. And I'm like, and I had no memory of this person before. So, and, and that was a really awkward, uncomfortable situation because I introduced myself to somebody who I wasn't so sure I'd ever met before. I, I had a vague feeling and, and I didn't follow that. But we can think about a lot of times in our lives, you walk into a room, why did I walk into this room? Or I opened up my phone to do something and now I'm seven hours into playing Candy Crush. How, how did I get to where I am right now? So it, in our lives, it's easy for us to forget. Um, sometimes it can be serious, and sometimes it can be, ah, I forgot, eh, that's kind of funny. Um, there are many ideas about how our minds work and how um, we remember things. Um, and I'm, I'm going to look at some different fields of thought about memory. So one field of thought um, comes from Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, is, in his you know, fictitious story, is said to have a tremendous memory, um, a tremendous ab ability to memorize different things. And in his field of thought, he had a memory attic. And so he, he had a memory attic. And so what does that mean? 
I'll try and explain it to you. So it's actually, it actually is a real thing, this, this idea of having a memory attic that some people believe and still believe to this day. And there's, this memory attic is a finite space that is you know, not real, it's an it's a abstract idea that is attached to a, an, an abstract space. So what it is, is according to a myth um, from the Greek poet Simonides, um, he invented the technique after attending a banquet that went wrong. So he was inside of this banquet, then he stepped outside to speak with some people, and then unfortunately the whole banquet hall, the whole building collapsed, crushing everyone inside. And everybody was crushed so badly that they couldn't be identified. Well this poet, Simonides, was supposedly able to remember each person and where they were based on where they had been sitting in the hall. The ability to remember based on location became the method also known um, in, in theater as the art of memory. And some people call this a memory palace. Sherlock Holmes called it a, me um, a, a memory attic or brain attic. So to use the technique, you would create a building in your mind. So whether or not it be a small little cabin or a giant palace, you would create this building in your mind. So everybody now take a minute to invent a small little building. Sometimes it's just four little walls. Some buildings are really small. And some buildings can be really, um, really um, complicated and ornate. So what you do is you attach the different parts of that building, whether or not it's a chair, you attach that to a memory. You attach a painting on the wall in your memory to, a, to another memory. You attach the door frame to another memory. Or if you go into another room, this can be a new field of memories. So this is actually a technique that some people try to use today to, um, to associate a place, whether or not it's real or not, to a memory. So that's one way that you can memorize things. Um, and some people, it really, it really worked for them. Some people say, uh, that's just fictitious. Actually, in history, some of the monks, before they actually had um, the ability to write, they would actually use this method to memorize things, to remember important facts before they were able to write things down. Then, when we were able to, you know, the inventing of the printing press allowed us to, um, you know, kind of circumvent this whole need to create these worlds of memory inside of our minds. So, nowadays, we have, we have written word. We have things that help us to memorize. We have technology that helps us. Now, in the Old Testament, people shared much of their culture and beliefs through spoken word and sharing with future generations that they had been taught. There wasn't a whole lot of things that were written down. So when you look at the Law of Moses, those, the Ten Commandments, there wasn't a lot of things that um, had been written down around that time. They had to be shared through speaking, and they had to be remembered. And so today, let's go back to Joshua. And when you look at Joshua, a few chapters later, you can start to see how the Israelites developed this pattern of forgetfulness. They weren't able to remember some very important things. So if you look at Joshua chapter 8, and we're going to start in verse 28. Uh, it says, Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace for 40 years. So this is jumping into the middle of something, but we're at this great victory that Gideon had in Israel. And it says here, the land had peace for 40 years. And then jumping forward a few verses, verse 33 says, No sooner had Gideon died that the, than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up baal Berith as their god and did not remember the Lord their god who had rescued them from the hands of their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jerobal, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. So here we see the Israelites shortly after we saw back in the beginning of Joshua, keep these laws on your lips, meditate on them. And then we see a few generations later, and then right after the generation of Gideon, we see this, the, the baton was not passed off. The memories of previous generations did not make it to the next generation. The values of following God did not make it to that. And, it, and I also want to point out the fact here, it said, they had peace for 40 years. So if you go back to verse 28, it said, they had peace. During Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace for 40 years. So that's a caution for us, that in our lives, even though you may be in a time of peace, 
You may be in a time where things are being, going well, things are being successful. We need to be careful as well that, oh, things are going well, there's, there's not much issues, we're, we're, you know, we're thriving. Um, I, would, I would argue that in our church right now, we have a very healthy, robust, thriving culture, and peaceful it may be classified. But we need to be careful because we can get spiritually flabby if we don't exercise our, our muscles or we don't exercise our, our mind muscles. We don't guard our hearts. It's possible that if we don't guard our hearts, we fall prey to the different schemes of the devil. It may seem that we're in a time of peace, but the devil is prowling the earth, seeking for different prey. Now, everyone has a problem with remembering things at one point in their lives or another. <clears throat> remembering can, like I said earlier, can lead to funny story, stories or awkward stories or you know unfortunate things. Um, but sometimes it can lead to more sad things. If, a, if you have a loved one who has dementia or Alzheimer's, that forgetfulness starts to seem like it's a, it's a different person that you're working with. There are many things that can go wrong with the human mind, and I'm not here to discuss all those things, but we all have different abilities within our memories. So when we're talking about memorizing things, everybody in this room has a different capacity for memory. Now, when I was talking about earlier about this whole idea of the mind attic and you have a finite amount of space, there's actually, if you look at research about memory, there's actually not a limit of how much can be memorized. There are some people that are professional memorizers and they've, they've been known to memorize up to 30 something, um, 30 something thousand consecutive numbers in a row. So these are people that can memorize up to 30 something thousand digits of pi as part of a competition. And so people can have a great p capacity to memorize things. And today I want to look at, I want to ask some questions about memory as it relates to God's word. And I also want to take some, ask some questions about meditating. Before we get into that though, I want to read for you a few facts about memory. Now these are actually scientific facts that I was able to find. Um, maybe they apply to you, maybe they, they don't. So some real facts about memory. Scientific research has shown that the human brain starts remembering things from the womb. In fact, memory begins to work 20 weeks after conception. And that connects to the second fact. It says memory has two components, short-term and long-term. Most short-term memories only last 20 to 30 seconds. So in the womb, and I'm not exactly sure how scientists were able to measure this, probably using different scanners and electrodes and things like that, but in the womb, um, children are starting to develop these memories, and many of them are short-term. You can kind of sit back and think, what is my first memory? And I can think very vividly of my first memory. My first memory, I remember um, I, was, I was either three or four, I got my tonsils out, and I remember waking up at my grandmother's house, and my Aunt Nancy was there. And, and, like, and so like, there's just these really weird pieces, and then you know, talking to my parents years later, like, oh yeah, that makes sense that she'd be babysitting or something like that. But we can think about our first earliest memory, and it's really interesting that your memories um, work in an interesting and, and unique way. Each person's memory is different. Now also, number three, memory is influenced by a variety of factors. For example, visual memory is based on what you saw, not what you hear. When you look at eyewitness testimony, sometimes the details are different. And I think Mark may have spoken about this a few weeks ago when he was talking about the different testimonies you see in the Bible. Um, these disciples that are there gave very different testimonies. They have very different memories, but they, be, you know, they all align, but they're all on different perspectives. Number four, the storage capacity of the human brain is virtually, virtually limitless. Yes, limitless. So they found through studying different people that they found people's ability to me memorize things as almost limitless. There's no ceiling that you're like, yep, I've memorized 52 words, I'm done, I can't memorize anymore. Um, people as adults are continually developing their vocabularies as they move on. And it's good because, you know, teenagers are inventing new words every other day. So it's good for us to kind of keep up on those things. Number five, caffeine does not maintain memory performance. However, it does increase alertness. So some people confuse the, those two. Number six, an adult can remember 20 to 100,000 words. So that's a pretty big range. Remember 20 to 100,000 words. Think about all the words you know. It'd take a long time for you to write down all the words that you, num you know. Number seven, sleep is important to memory. 
While scientists don't know exactly how it affects the brain, it has been shown that sleep aids the storage and retrieval of long-term memories. So if you're having a hard time remembering things, you might just need a good nap. Um, number eight, many people associate memory loss with aging. However, the memory loss we see in the older we get is generally because we tend to exercise our brains less as we age. So there's actually not much evidence showing that just getting older makes you forgetful. It's actually the fact that many people who are older aren't as cognitively busy. You know, some people as they retire, I'm going to sit on the beach. I'm not going to, you know, be using my mind. And you actually see a lot of different apps on phones that people use to exercise their brains. The, um, the brain is thought of as a muscle in that way. Number nine, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to turn my page here. Number nine, your memory can associate a scent with a certain event or occurrence. So think about a time where you smell something and it just brings you back. You just have this memory of something 25 years ago. Wow, that brought me back. Um, I've had that experience sometimes in my life. Um, I smelled some things yesterday at the Spartan race that would probably bring back some traumatic memories. But you can definitely have different scents that bring out different things. If you smell apple pie, that might make you think of your grandmother's cooking at Thanksgiving you know, decades ago. It's an interesting how our God made our minds. Number 10, there's also such a thing as a false memory. Researchers are beginning to understand that the human mind can create, exaggerate, distort, or reinvent a memory after a traumatic experience or something that impacted you greatly. So different, um, and the, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time about this, but different traumatic events can actually cause people to remember things differently. One example that I've heard about and um, I've seen some different, um, I've read some different things about is people that are in um, plane crashes. Some people have no memory of it because their mind refused to memorize that. They, they disassociated themselves. So there are different traumatic events that can impact your memory as well. And finally, number 11, you must exercise your mind just like any other muscle in your body. So the harder you think about memory, the more likely you are, you are to remember it. Thinking will create a stronger link between active neurons. So you can think of the brain as a muscle. And when we're talking about you know, the different things in the Bible, when we're talking about our spiritual walk, think about your mind as a muscle and how you can memorize different things. So, that kind of leads us to the question as to why do, we, why do we memorize things? Why is it important to memorize things? Well, if you look in Psalms 119.11, this is actually a popular verse to memorize, so it's a, it's a memory verse about memorizing. Um, Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So why am I hiding God's word in my heart? Well, there's a very specific reason that I may not sin against you, so, so that I may not sin against God. In the Bible, specifically in Judges, you'll see the cycle of the Israelites having God's power demonstrated to them through these amazing people, these judges, and then shortly after, almost immediately in the next generation, it's kind of cliche. They forget him, they forget the, his law, they start indulging in the sins of other nations and the, the gods that they follow. So we see this in the Bible. We see this forgetfulness. So how do we do that? How do we combat that in our lives? And how do we, you know, not get in the same cycle? How could the, how could the Israelites have not continued to get in this cycle of forgetting and remembering God and his law? Well, I think, you know, my personal belief in this is that they may have been missing some of this verse here. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. It doesn't say there your word I have memorized so that I may not sin against you. That's a very important phrase there. Your word I have hidden in my heart. What does it mean to hide something in our hearts? One thing that um, many of my generation were a part of growing up were Bible bowls. Who here was ever part of a Bible bowl? So for those of you who are not familiar with a Bible bowl, um, there's, you're given a specific book or chapters of a book. You study it. You memorize as much as you can, and then you get into a competition with other churches or other groups of adolescents to 
see who can win based on a buzzer system. You know, you line up, you get these buzzers, and you know, whoever answers this question, and there's a mixture of questions ranging from you know, simply memorizing verses or different facts about it, like how many people were you know, in, in Egypt at this time. So there's a lot of different ways that the Bible Bowl worked. Um, for me, reflecting on it, I was very competitive as a kid and sometimes didn't have a healthy mindset going into these things. I would, I would see these other churches as the enemies that we needed to defeat to show how powerful God's word was in our lives. And it was kind of like trying to measure who was better, who was the better Bible student. And so for me, and I know, and I've talked to other people that they did not have this perspective. And I think that it was a good tool for a lot of people to get into God's word and that competitive thing. For me, I had a mixture of the two that when I lost a lot of the memory verses that I had just memorized, I did not apply to my own life. I, I did not behave in an appropriate way, but this was as a child um, and trying to learn from there. So, but then it's not, it's not good enough for us to have God's word memorized. It needs to be hidden in our hearts. Turn with me, if you can, to James chapter 1. And I'll say that again. It's not good enough for us to have God's word memorized. It needs to be hidden in our hearts. So James 1.22 says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So here there's a, there's a combination here between remembering and doing. In the Bible, you see a, a big connection between faith and action. There are many verses in the Bible, actually, about forgetting. When I was getting ready for this sermon, I found the word forget many times. People are forgetful, and not in the way that, you know, they, have, they just can't remember something. Often, we're forgetful because we put our, push our focus from our first love onto different things. In our lives, we're prioritizing our lives in a way where we're going to forget them. If I don't continually exercise my mind in studying scripture, as Justin was talking about last week, then we're going to start to see that other things are going to encapsulate our memories. In many relationships, people fall apart, not always because they lose interest, which sometimes does happen, but because their interest is stolen by other things. So a lot of times you'll see you know, I remember my love, and I, and I love my, my wife, but then people start to lose interest because they start to love other things. And that may be the truth for, for us in our relationship with God, that I'm not losing interest in him. I just have things that I'm more interested in. Well, you can see how my loss of interest is directly connected to my not prioritizing God in, our, in my life. So what are some reasons that we forget God's word, or forget his teachings. Well, here, here are three, just a very short list of some, some simple ways that we do forget. Because in the Bible, it says the word forget a lot, or forgetful. You'll see that very often in the Old Testament. When you're looking at judges, the children of Israel forgot God's law. And then, what happens after that? So one reason is we don't spend the time. We don't spend the time with God's word. That's one reason we don't remember it. If I'm not continually exercising my spiritual muscles, the muscles in my mind, then we're going to forget that word. Number two, one thing is we don't ex exercise those spiritual muscles. We don't use it. So if I'm sitting somewhere in a cabin and, you know, excluded from the world and I'm just memorizing scripture, if it doesn't have any application in my life, if there's not a connection between reading God's word and applying it, then we're going to forget it because if you're not using it, you're going to lose it. And then finally, number three, we haven't given him our hearts. We haven't given him our hearts. So if you're going to love someone, you're going to listen to what they're going to say. If I love someone, I'm going to listen to them. If I love my spouse, I'm going to listen to them. If I love my children, I'm going to listen to them. If I love um, a friend, I'm going to listen to them. If we love God and we've given him our hearts, then we're going to want 
what he says on our lips, in our minds, on our thoughts. And we're going to meditate on that. John chapter 14 actually gives us some, some other insights on how to remember or how to not forget. There's a very powerful tool that we have to not forget. John chapter 14, starting in verse 23, says, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. And continuing in verse 25, All this I have spoken with you still, excuse me, all this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all these things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So let's say you're somebody, you're, you're not an academic, you don't, you're not a person who memorizes numbers or equations and I, you know, I'm just not really good at remembering things. Well, we have a very powerful tool here and his name is the Holy Spirit. It says here that when Jesus left or when he's going to leave, that he's going to send the advocate, the Holy Spirit, in his name to help us. And what does it say? Very specifically, it says that he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Now at that time, again, there wasn't like, there was, nobody had a video recording of Jesus during his life. And so there was a need for people to remember very vividly some things that they may not have remembered. But I believe this also applies to our lives as well, that if I need to remember something, or if I need something very important on my heart to, or in my mind continually, we have this excellent helper here. We have the Holy Spirit to teach us and to remind us of everything that Jesus taught us. So maybe, let's say, you know what, I've tried to remember things, I've tried to memorize some scripture, and you're not having success. Well, sometimes you're going to need to ask for help. When we have this helper called the Holy Spirit. And I can't tell you that, you know, you pray once and you're immediately going to be able to remember everything, but I can tell you that the Holy Spirit will be working in your life to help you to remember um, everything that it, the Lord needs you to remember. Jesus shares with his disciples that the Holy Spirit um, will come and teach us to remind us things. And also, that peace will be associated with that. I'm, I firmly believe that the more scripture that I dwell on, the more that I focus my mind on what God's word has said, the more peace I'm going to have in my life. And, and, and the, sometimes we don't have peace in our lives because we're looking for peace in other ways. I'm not going to have peace because I'm good at exercising or good at watching sports or good at something that really upset, you know, takes a lot of my time. I'm going to have peace because God's word is in me. So that begs the question, why is, that we should, why is it that we should memorize scripture? So I'm an educator, and I've had this question a lot. Well, why do I need to learn arithmetic? Why do I need to learn mathematical skills in my life? Well, back in the day, you needed to learn math because you had to do it, and you didn't, the teacher would always say, well, you're not going to have a calculator with you. And this isn't very long ago. I think I heard this when I was a kid. You're not going to have a calculator carrying around like some crazy person. But now, we all have a calculator. So, you know, like then, so that, that reasoning goes out the window. Why do I need to memorize scripture? Well, you need to memorize it because you never know when you're going to need it. Well, I have scripture right here. So why do I need to remember things? So that's a really good question. And, and there's actually a really good answer to that. Um, so... Do we need to memorize it because you never know when your phone's going to die? Well, that's a good reason to memorize it. But the same reason, so what I would tell my students is like, well, you need, to, you need to memorize things because your mind is a tool that you learn to reason through things. And, and you memorizing things and you applying those things and you working through and problem solving is going to make you more successful in reasoning and problem solving and understanding other things in your life. There's a direct connection to your ability to remember the alphabet to you remembering how to speak English. 
So if I can remember these basic skills and I'm learning and it, it, it compounds on it so that in the Bible, well, why do I need to memorize? Well, I think it's important that in case you need to have a verse, that you have it like that. That is a, an excellent skill to have. But we need to memorize scripture because it's something that we're going to have to connect to our lives. I need to memorize scripture because I'm going to be walking down the street and I'm going to be challenged by something, whether or not it's sin or a thought in my mind. And I need to have that scripture in my mind so that I can use that tool immediately. It's not like, oh, what did it say there? <laughs> no, it's going to be like, oh, wow, this person is gossiping and I need to not engage in it because I have this verse in my mind. Or this person, you know, there's something here I should not be looking at. This is a scripture that's going to help me immediately. And who, who used scripture to combat different things from the devil? Jesus. When, when, when the devil was tempting him, he had scripture immediately. He used that to fight that spiritual war. And we have this tool that we need, we need these scriptures not written there just for the information of it, because it gets to our hearts. And I think this next verse really, encapsulating, really encapsulates what I was just trying to say. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, we'll read that whole piece. It says, Colossians 3, 15 through 17, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And I really wanted to highlight verse 16. Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly. So memorizing scripture isn't about having the facts there. Isn't it, is it, it isn't about, hey, um, I'm going to point out to somebody and I need them to tell me a scripture. No, that's, that's not what it is. I, we're told here to apply that. So if the message of Christ dwells in us, then that dwelling inside of us is going to overflow into our lives. And we don't have time to look at all the different scriptures where Jesus rebukes the Pharisees, but Pharisees were really good at memorizing things. They were like professional memorizers. You know how like those people at those spelling bees like, can memorize all these different words? They, these guys were professional memorizers, and they had it down pat. But the problem is they didn't have those scriptures alive in their lives. They didn't have God's law and the idea that we needed grace and forgiveness. We needed redemption. They didn't have that in, our, in their lives. There, there was, they were really missing that application part. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. So I'm not going to tell you, hey, if you don't memorize five, five scriptures a month, then you're not letting the message of Christ dwell in you richly. No, everybody has a different capacity. Everybody's different. What I will tell you is if you're not dwelling on the word of God, then you really do run the risk of his word not being active and alive in your life. Maybe you can memorize one scripture a year. I think that's more important than memorizing five books of the Bible if you don't apply it. I have a, personally, I have a decent memory. I can memorize things pretty quickly. It helped me in school a lot. Yeah, that's great. But if, if I don't apply that knowledge to loving other people, I th that's why I say it's, I think it's more important to learn one verse and apply it very well than it is to memorize a, a magnitude of different things. Think about somebody you know that's really, that was really knowledgeable about Scripture but was really missing that you know, loving other people piece of it or applying that to other parts of their lives. And that's why the Pharisees were called hypocrites. They had, the, they had this the, the, in their minds, but they didn't have, God tells us, to, we're told to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and, and, and our mind. Not just our mind. And if you have just your mind, then it's, you're going to see a lot of hypocrisy in that as well. So what are some ways that we can memorize God's word and meditate on it? I think if you have one and not the other, if you memorize that's good. If you meditate, that's good. But if you have that combination between the two, it's going to be very powerful. If I memorize a verse and I think deeply about it, remember that, that definition, to think deeply about it, or intently, or f in a focused way, then it's going to go into our lives. So some ways that I've found are helpful, and there, don't get me wrong, there are many more ways to memorize things. 
How do we memorize and meditate? Well, be intentional. And some of this is going to be an overlap from what Justin said last week. But be intentional. Set quality time aside. If you want to improve in anything in your life, you're going to have to put on your calendar, at this time of day, I'm going to be doing this so I can improve on this. And if you don't put the time, set it aside, you're not going to, you're not going to follow through with it. Number two, let his word invade all areas of our lives. Let his word invade all areas of our lives. So what does that mean? It means that his word, it's living and active, it should be piercing into all the different areas of our lives. If we're talking about scripture, and like, well, I'm just going to focus on it while I'm at home, well, no, we need to have scripture on our mind as well when we're at work. I can't tell you the number of times where I've thought about, you know, I've run into a problem at work with either an adult or a child or some other type of person, and I'm not sure if there are other types, but <laughs> let's not think about that too much. But the, the, those words are very helpful. Those words are very helpful in my, in my personal life, regardless of where you go. And finally, repetition. Visually, I know some people that like to put those cute little, you know, decorate those cute little index cards and they put it by their mirror and then all of a sudden, you know, I, I, my younger sister Chrissy did this all the time and I, I just memorized these things because they're sitting around the house. Like I wasn't even really trying to, I'm sitting there brushing my teeth and like, oh, I've got that memorized now. And so like that repetition, visually, audibly, um, I also had a, a younger cousin, his name's Francisco, he was, he would smoke us in these Bible bowls because he would listen to the, the scripture and he would just do amazing. Like it was amazing how that repetition allowed him to memorize the different th um, scriptures. And then finally in song. So when I can think of some songs, like we just sang a song, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Uh, um, you know, that's one. Or um, we sang a song. A lot of the songs we sing here are directly from scripture as they should be. Those are, that's, that's actually biblical, to have scripture in songs. Um, I, there's one verse, um, no man can tame the tongue, it is an unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. The only reason I have that song memorized is because my mom made up this silly little jingle when I was trying to memorize it 15 years ago at camp. And so like, I can memorize that, I, that's in my mind because of song. So there, I'm not going to tell you one way to do this, but think in your lives that maybe you need to listen to some Christian music that has some scripture in it. Um, I, I think sometimes with Christian music, it, they get a little too cute with things and we're just trying to, you know, be relevant and hip with the culture and we're not really getting those, those, that scripture in there. So those are three ways. Um, there are many more ways to memorize. So what I would encourage you to do is find what works for you. If you want to memorize God's word, if you want to meditate on it, you need to set aside that quality time, set aside that quality time. And then you need to find what works for you. These are things that work for many people, so try some different things. Put up some scriptures around your house, and then you know, those people who can read are probably going to start to remember those things. Um, the, everybody goes to the bathroom. Put some scripture in there. People are going to remember that. <clears throat> so, but it is possible to have much, a lot of scripture in your mind and have no love, have no Christ in your hearts. So that, that's why, you know, I think it's really important to have these two thoughts, meditating and memorizing, closely together. If we love Christ and want to be his followers, then we need to have his words echoing in our minds. There are many versions of the Bible, so I don't want you to sit here and say, well, you know, when, so I was growing up, a lot of the scripture I memorized was New King James Version. Now I use NIV. Like, you can really start to worry about the little different words and things like that. That's not really important, I don't think. I think as long as you're getting the Bible in your mind. And, and when you're, yes, you're doing competitions like a Bible Bowl or when you're memorizing for competitions, they're going to want you to have it exactly right according to a specific version. But in the Bible, it tells us that we need to have the message of Christ dwell among us richly. So, also, when you get to heaven, there's not going to be a score of how much scripture you had memorized. All right, Bill, you had seven verses memorized very well. 53 mediocre and 72 poorly. So, like, there, those are things that aren't going to happen. There, there's really no scriptural basis for that. God wants our hearts. And I think that's really what, what matters about memorizing and meditating is that fills up our hearts with God's word. 
He wants us to be filled with the many good things that he has shown us. He's given us the book of life. He's given us uh, the, this book that gives life. And he wants us to have that life. And we're only going to have it if we study it and we memorize it and meditate on it. So what I'm not trying to convey to you is that memorizing isn't important. It is important, but there's not a score that's going to be attached to that. And the, the band can come. I want to look at one more verse here before we close. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. It says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Sometimes we think about things that really flood our minds and they can be good things. They can be things that are interesting and they're not harmful. But if they're taking the place of God and his word, then that is a problem. Yesterday, we, a group of us decided to go out and run in the back muddy woods of Ohio. Um, but before that, it's, we, before our race yesterday, there's somebody with a microphone pumping us up for the race so that you run that first mile really fast and then the rest of them you walk. But in that, in that speech, it was a very powerful speech, the one thing the speaker said is, I don't know your why, but you need to have the will to finish. Well, thankfully for us, we do have the why. We do have that why in our lives. And it really is sad, like, looking around like, you guys don't have a why? <laughs> like, if, if you don't have a why and you're sitting here about to run 13 miles, then you're not, you may not finish. But if you have that, that perspective, and if we have that perspective in our lives that I have a reason why I'm going to do this, then we will finish. So we've been given the Bible. We've been given these tools. And maybe in your life you've forgotten things. Maybe you've forgotten some scripture. But more importantly, maybe you've forgotten to apply that scripture to your life. Maybe you've forgotten your first love, your first love of Christ. And at this time, this is a good time for us to remember. Remember our first love, as it says in Revelations. God doesn't simply want our minds. He wants our heart, our soul as well. So remember. Remember scripture. Remember God's word and meditate on it day and, light, day and night. Um, please rise as we pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for loving us enough to give us a mind that can remember things, giving us your word that we can commit to memory and to dwell on and meditate on. Thank you for your son that he said so many powerful things to give us guidance in our lives and to um, give us words that can bounce around in our minds that we can apply to our lives while we're here. Um, I know that your word does not guarantee us of a, an easy life or things that are going to help us or um, even make us prosperous every day, but I, I pray that you will use us in a way that we can be full of you and use your spirit to fill us up so that we can overflow the love that you've given us into other people's lives. Thank you again so much for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every heart of our praise. Oh, 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 oh. Your presence in this place. Show us, show us your 
to get the baptistry ready and then we will be baptizing Amanda so you are free to stick around you are dismissed but that will happen in about 10 minutes <laughs> 